Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Again, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Please be seated. Good morning once again. I hope you're glad to be here today. I know I am. It is always such a, an amazing thing to be able to gather together with God's people and to, to share together in songs and prayers and in remembrance to, to partake of the blessing of, of hearing God's word. You know, we've done a lot of talking today. We've spoken to each other with songs and hymns and spiritual songs. We've talked to God. We, we've told him that we're remembering. We, we've told him that, that we recognize that our things are his things, and, and we've given them back to him. You know, this is the point in the, ser- in the service where God talks to us. We open up his word, and we let him talk. And let's hear what he has to say back to us. It is a blessed privilege to come before the throne of God and to worship him. But we need not allow God to be silent. We want God to speak. And so would you please bow with me as uh, we prepare for our lesson this morning. Our Father and our God in heaven, hallowed be your awesome name. We thank you so much for the innumerable blessings that you've showered down upon us. And we thank you so much, Father, for the blessing of being here today. As we open up your word, we ask you to speak to our hearts and minds. Convict us, encourage us, and sustain us. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. I would encourage you to join me in chapter 5 of Ephesians. Chapter 5. Today we're going to take a long look at the idea of walking the Christian walk. There's a statement we're going to read here in just a moment that says, and walk in love. And the idea here is not about putting one foot in front of the other. The idea here is something much better than that. It's about our manner of living. It's about our existence. That's our walk. And we're to walk in love in so many different avenues in this life with our focus on so many different things. And the reason for that is going to be given to us. We're not just told by God, walk in love. He gives us a very sound reason for doing that. There are three walks that we're going to find in Ephesians chapter 5. And we want to look at those three walks And then we want to expand that thought for just a few moments this morning. The first is found in Ephesians 5 and verse 2. And walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Walk in love, how? Just as Christ has loved us this idea of walking in love is is giving a daily offering to god of ourselves as brian just read a few moments ago from romans chapter 12 verse 1 in particular tells us that we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice that living sacrifice is to be holy and acceptable to god God doesn't have to accept just any sacrifice. He tells us the type of sacrifice to give. 
and one that's, that's holy is the one that's acceptable. The one that's the living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. You know, we, we don't martyr ourselves in the physical sense. We martyr ourselves daily in the spiritual sense, giving ourselves over to God in many different ways. We die to ourselves in, in how we take care of other people. We die to ourselves by showing what is truly important to the world to us. You know, the world is always trying to tell us what should be important to us. And don't you love the way the world tells Christians what they're supposed to believe? I find that fascinating. You know, they can only name one verse in the Bible, and that's Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. And then they tell us how we're supposed to live as Christians. Folks, we're, we're supposed to show the world what's important to us by how we live our lives. And so we are to walk in love. Number two, down in 5 verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Walking as children of light shows that we are under some authority. We are not our own authority. As children, we're under the Father's authority. And when you look down just a couple of verses later in verse 10, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. To walk as children of light is to walk in pursuit of those things that are acceptable to God. You know, there's a lot of implications in this verse. And there's a lot of people that preach and teach doubt when it comes to Christianity. Well, we just can't know. We can't know that. We can't know. We can't know. Listen, if it wasn't possible for us to know what's acceptable to the Lord, we would not be told to pursue that. Because we'd be pursuing something we could never attain. But yet, God has made it possible for us to know what's acceptable to Him because He's told us in His precious Word the very things that are important. And so we're to be in pursuit of those things as children of light. And thirdly, 515. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circumspectly means to do something exactly, accurately, and diligently as we walk. We are to walk in an exact and accurate way, in a diligent way, not according to what I say and what you say, but according to what God has said. Now, who did Jesus die for? I heard me. Did he only die for, for Christians? He died for the world. Christians are the ones who've recognized that sacrifice and have adjusted our life to what God's called us to be. But we've got a whole world of people out there that are not following the things that God has called for them to do, and therefore they are not walking in love, they are not walking as children of light, and they are not walking circumspectly. You know why? Because they hadn't read the instruction manual. They don't know what it says. They're a God unto themselves, and their truth changes from day to day according to whatever it is that they want to follow. We have a calling as God's children to live in a certain way. And that is outlined for us. Our treatment and our behavior of others is paramount to walking in love. We're going to look at four things here. We're going to be reading from the end of chapter 4 through the beginning of chapter 6. And then over the next four weeks, we're going to break these down individually and discuss them. Because they're too important to just pass over in a survey. Beginning in chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. 
Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sweet sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving thanks. For this you know. That no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God has come upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Now, bear with me briefly because we're not going to spend a great deal of time here. Who is Paul writing to? In the Ephesian letter, Christians or non-Christians? He's writing to the church. He's writing to saints. He's writing to Christians, both from Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. He's writing to Christians. Why is he telling them not to lie to each other? Because they were lying to each other. Why is he telling them to forgive each other? Because they weren't forgiving each other. Why is he telling them not to be angry? Because they were being angry with each other. Folks, he's not writing this just because he had extra ink and paper. He's writing this because it was a problem present in the church in Ephesus. And folks, it's a problem in the church in Puyallup. We've got to figure it out. These words are ours today. The Ephesian church has long since passed into history. The Puyallup church is now. This is to us. How we treat one another is paramount to our salvation that can't be changed imitate God as dear children now I want you to look at the you know Paul in his letters he, he always has a scandal sheet doesn't he when you read them long enough you, you have you have this little section and he lists all these sins that that people are are supposed to avoid. And those things are usually particular to that church because you're going to see the list are a little bit different in each one, not saying that it's okay to do one thing and not okay to do another thing depending on the church you're in, but he's addressing the needs that church has. But when you look at the scandal sheet that that we find here, these sins down here beginning in verse 4, filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting, Uh, Verse 5, fornicator, unclean, covetous, idolater. All of those things have to do with how we treat and address other people. Our relationship with each other. Why is he telling them these things? Because they struggled with it. Why do we need to hear it? Because we struggle with the same things. And you know, it's not enough that you don't do it physically. Jesus laid that argument to rest in Matthew chapter 5 when he tells us, you've heard it said of them of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust after her in his heart has already committed adultery. What is Jesus saying? It's not enough to just avoid the physical act. You've got to clean it up from the inside. And you might not physically be involved in some of these things, but folks, 
I don't know your heart, but God does. And there's some places in your heart that need to be cleaned up. All of us. Secondly, our treatment and behavior towards sin. We're stumbling right here, church. We, we, we believe the lie from the world that you're not supposed to judge to the point that we won't even point out sin anymore. And I'm going to tell you, it's got to start at the house of God. Do you remember in, in chapter 7 about sin? And about judging judge not that you be not judged but then jesus goes about telling us how to judge so obviously we're supposed to judge somehow we're supposed to be discerning we're supposed to discern is this in god's will or is this not in god's will we're supposed to have that discerning spirit based upon what god has taught us and he says why do you have a log in your eye walking around looking for a speck in somebody else's eye. Do you know what Jesus, Jesus just turned forever on the head the human nature aspect of sin because always and forever it's my little sin and it's your great big sin. And Jesus said, no, it's your great big sin and it's his or her little bitty sin. The problem is in perspective. And if we're taking care of this huge plank that is sticking out of our eye, then we're going to be in a lot better shape to help somebody recognize and overcome the little sin in their life. Now, God doesn't see them as little big in big sins. Jesus is trying to change our perspective on things. Sin, our treatment and behavior of sin. Let's look in uh, chapter 5, verse 8. And following down through 17 for you were once darkness who was once darkness the Christians in Ephesus who was once darkness the Christians in Puyallup it's what we once were but praise God we're not that anymore walk as uh, children of light for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness righteousness and truth finding out what is acceptable to the Lord And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Now, in two weeks, Lord willing... If I'm not fired before then, and I don't die, we're going we're gonna to break this down. But I want you to start looking at this right now. I want you to think about the things that you're watching on television. And I want you to think about the things you're listening to on your headset. And I want you to think about the things that you're reading. I want you to think about that. Because the scripture says to Christians have no fellowship do not partake with them do not share with them in these unfruitful works of darkness we are in the world but not of the world we cannot help people come out of the world if we're not in the world but if we're partaking of the very same things the world is then how is it that we can tell them to stop doing that when we're doing the same thing sin is opposition to the will of God twice it says understand what the will of God is in that section of scripture twice because God has made it plain for us we have to make sure that we understand how we treat and how we behave towards sin number three worship verses 18 through 21 And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, 
speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. Do you know what one of the common ways to worship was in Ephesus? To worship the, the God of wine, Dionysus. And guess how you worship the God of wine? You get drunk. That's how you did it. And we're to be filled with the Spirit rather than to be drunk with wine. We're not worshiping false gods and following after those things. We're to worship the one true and living God. And I've heard people go to Ephesians uh, 5, 19 and say, oh, well, that's not talking about worship. Now, somebody tell me how we can speak to one another in Psalms, hymns, spiritual psalms if we're not assembled together. You can't fulfill what it is it's, instru it's instructing us to do if we're not together. And at what point does the church all come together where we can speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? When we gather to worship. You know, now if you want to go down the street singing to people, God bless you for that. But the one another passage is talking about to other Christians. We've got to be together in order to do that. When, when we're not together, you know, in the parallel verse in Colossians 3.16, we're going to address that as well when we get into uh, this study in three weeks. If I still have my job then. And we're going to talk about it because there it says teach and admonish one another. Okay? Can you speak to me? Can you teach me? And can you admonish me in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs if you're not where I am? You can't. Number four. With our marriage and families. We've got to walk in love. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her by the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two, two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. There is a very important verse there in verse 32 that says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Folks, when we get done talking about family and marriage, we're going to spend some time talking about the importance of the church. You don't need to go any further than this one verse right here where it says, Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of what? The body. Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23 tell us that Christ is head of the church, his body. The word body and church are used interchangeably in this Ephesian letter. Interchangeably. If Christ is the Savior of the body, what's the body? It's the church. If you want to be saved, where do you need to be? You need to be in the body. Because he's the savior of the body. But our marriages and our families have suffered. They have suffered and we're not helping collectively as we should. 
We, we have good examples around us and we have bad examples around us. We're not honoring our spouses. We're not raising our children properly. And you know, when, you, when we get to this section right here, you're going to notice something in this section of Scripture. There's a whole lot more that is told to the husband than is told to the wife. Everybody wants to go to that, that passage about the wife and they want to get all up in arms. Where is the wife told to love her husband as Christ loved the church? How did Christ love his church? He died for her. The husband's got a very stronger line that he has to follow. And submission doesn't mean second-class citizen. Because in the previous verse it says, submitting to one another. We submit to one another. We respect one another. We honor one another. And that's talking about everybody in the church. And that is equally true even more so in our marriages. But there is a hierarchy that God has placed for us in our marriages. And we need to respect that. But it's hard to respect it when one or the other is not doing their part. It's hard for the, the wife to submit when the husband is not fulfilling his responsibilities. It's hard for the husband when the wife is not fulfilling her responsibilities. Folks, it is a partnership, and it is not 50-50. It's 100%, 100%. If it's not, something's missing. It is a partnership ordained by God. It is the first of three great institutions ordained by God on planet Earth. The first was the family, the husband and wife, marriage. The second are governments which no government has authority except that which is given by God, Romans 13. And the third is the church. Those are the three great institutions ordained by God. And the first is marriage. We need to respect it. We need to promote it. And we need to follow what God says with regard to our marriages. You know, not only must we walk in love, Excuse me. But the world desperately needs to see Christians walking in love. Instead of standing around picketing things, you know, if you want to go picket, that's fine. But if that's all you ever do in the name of faith, you've missed the entire point of Christianity. Christianity is about service, it's about honor, it's about love, it's about loving those who hate you. It's about enduring persecution for the sake of the master who endured a greater persecution than you will ever endure. The world needs to see you living your faith in a biblical way. Not just because you got a fish sticker on the back of your car as you're cutting people off in traffic. Folks, it, th this is where you get your hands dirty. It's everyday practical living as a Christian. Walk in love. Therefore, Ephesians 5 verse 1 says, Be imitators of God as dear children. You want to talk about a standard that's impossible? That's it. But that's the goal. That is our goal, to imitate God in all that we do. Next verse, just as Christ offered himself for us, we're to offer ourselves for others and to offer ourselves as a sacrifice back to God. Back to our scripture reading from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, Paul is pleading, he's begging with the Roman church. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable service, your thought out, your logical service to God. And do not be conformed to this world. 
Who is Paul writing to in the Roman letter? He's writing to Roman Christians from Jewish and Gentile background. Do not be conformed to this world. That's a problem in the church. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we go through the next four or five weeks looking at this passage right here from Ephesians chapter 5, we need to bear in mind this walking in love is is a living sacrifice lifestyle. And it's not just in our marriages, it's not just in our worship, it's not just in our attitude towards sin, it's not just in our attitude towards others, it's all of that. It's all of it. Because if you don't have it all, you've got nothing. You don't get to pick and choose. This morning, you're here. And I don't know why you're here. You may be here because you, you're just overflowing with appreciation for what God has done for you in your life. Praise God for that. Thank you for being here. Others, you may be here because you're just in the habit of coming. Because your body doesn't feel right if it's not sitting here at 11 o'clock on Sunday. I want to challenge you 168 hours in the week coming to church one hour a week is that a living sacrifice is that taking up your cross I mean enduring my sermons might be considered taking up your cross is that taking up your cross or are there 168 hours in the week and it encompasses all of that That's our living sacrifice. That's taking up your cross. If you're here today, and that's kind of been your habit, I I want you to reflect. I want you to to consider changing. Ask God to help you, to strengthen you, to make a change so that your life can be different, better than you've ever imagined. You might be here today because you're struggling with something, and you're struggling with it so hard. There's discouragement. There's sin. There might be a sickness. There's something in your life that is pulling you down. And you came today just hoping that God would would pierce your heart, would touch your heart, would help you, would provide encouragement for you, provide hope for you. Or maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. And you may be here at the behest of another, or you may have chosen to be here all by yourself. If you're not a Christian today, it's impossible for you to walk in love like the things we've talked about because we're to be following Christ and imitating God, and you can't do that until you give your life over to Him. You can't do that in the fullest sense. Do that today. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe it was prophesied in the Old Testament that he was coming, that he came, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived his life sinlessly, that he went to that cross, that he bore your sins on that cross, that he died, that he was buried, that he was raised the third day? Do you believe that he ascended to heaven and he's coming back? If you believe those things, are you willing to confess that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins turn from those things turn to the cross embrace the sacrifice that jesus made paying for your sins and be buried with him that is being immersed in water for the remission of your sins god will wash those things away you'll be raised to walk in a new life a forgiven life clothed in jesus christ and when god looks at you he doesn't see your sin anymore he sees his son and you can begin to walk in love like what we've talked about here Our brothers prepared a song for us to sing. And as we sing this song, if there is a need that you have, no matter how small or how large it is, please come forward. Make it known to us. Let us pray with you, pray for you, and help you. Let's stand together and sing.